Sheldon, we, we saw each other there at Women Deliver. It must have been 2007. You didn't go to that one? Hello, welcome everybody. Such a, such a hard act to follow. But we're here and we're here in Davos also transmitting. Um, thanks to Female Quotient to all across the world. This is an important panel. This is an important panel for me as well as a new narrative for caregivers in the workplace. I am surrounded by a great group of panelists and I'm going to start uh, by asking you to introduce yourself, what you do and why do you care? Hi everyone. I'm Michelle Milford Morris. I'm the Vice President for Girls and Women's Strategy at the UN Foundation. And I care about this topic because I think uh, economy should work for women. Right. Hello, I'm Anna Frelton. I am the CEO of Maternity Foundation. We are focused on, you know, where it all starts, you know, to ensure safer childbirth for women everywhere. Um, and our key focus is really on, you know, reaching and supporting midwives and nurses at the front line, because that's how we know that we can save most women for not dying during childbirth. And I care for this you know, for the same reason for you, and because I think it's wonderful that we are including all the women and in the men in this conversation, mm -hmm. yes. Hi everyone, I'm Tara Abrahams. I'm the head of Impact at The Meteor, which is a feminist media company focused on using the power of storytelling to advance gender equity and s racial justice. And the reason that I care about this issue, I was particularly keyed in on the narrative part of the title of the panel. I'm certainly passionate about the importance of investing in caregivers, but I'm really interested in exploring what it means to create new narratives and ways that we talk about this issue. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm James Hodge. Uh, I'm the Group Vice President and Chief Strategy Advisor at Splunk. I care about this because we need to change the conversation. I basically don't want to be my dad who I saw leave the, the house at six in the morning and then maybe come back at 10 at night. And it's time for change. And I love that. And actually, let's start with that. So let's start off with uh, talking about where we've been, what has been working, and how has that previous work model put working moms and others at disadvantage? So who would like to start? I, I like can, you started I, with a model. Let's go for it. Yes. I, I can start. Um, so my, my wife, um, she's a military doctor, anesthesiologist, intensive care. And to give you an example of what that life is like, uh, last summer, we, we got a phone call, we sat at night, we're about to book a holiday, and they said, you've got an hour to leave the house, you've got three hours to get on a plane, and then she's taking off, you know, combat, pistol, to go and help with a couple evacuation. It's a very different job to someone like me who's coming here to speak for a few minutes, and I'll claim that as a victory for a week. <laughs> and that means you've got to change the way that you think about your household, the way you think about um, your children, the way you want to go and show your children there's a different life ahead of it. I've got a six-year-old daughter and an eight-year-old boy. And that has to start with me. Uh, first supporting my wife, but also then starting to look at how I become a big part of their life. But most importantly, show other people in my organization that it's okay to say, I can't make that off-site. I can't do this meeting. I've got to go to see my child nativity play. I need to be here. I won't be in the office today because I've got stuff to do. Um, I'm not right all the time. I'm <laughs> learning about this topic. I frequently get it wrong. But I'm trying, and I'm trying to set an example. Anyone else on that? I mean, what I would say, thank you, first of all, James, for being um, a male caregiver on this panel. I think that's one of the critical themes that we've seen throughout our time at Davos, which is to say, when we get to conversations about gender and gender equity, we need to have all genders represented in the conversation. That's a critical aspect of this. What I would say in terms of, Claudia, you said you, the way that you posed the question was what has been working. It's so hard sometimes for me to think about it in that frame because I'm, I'm looking to what hasn't worked. I mean, we have a, um, a weekly podcast at The Meteor where we're able to interview incredible advocates and activists across a range of issues. One of them is Aijen Pu, who does um, amazing work to support the care economy, caregivers, domestic care workers, and the policies that will better support them. And one of the things that she talks about was that even before the pandemic, the whole care infrastructure was a house of cards. There really was no care infrastructure, truly, to support women and men in terms of balancing their work responsibilities and their care responsibilities. So the pandemic merely exposed the fractures that already existed in our system for decades because it wasn't built to support caregivers coming and being successful and thriving in the workplace. So one of the things that Aijan also talks about is the importance of sharing stories. I mean, if we asked every single one of the people in this room, on the promenade, in the big fancy uh, conference center, if they can come up with an example of caregiving, a story about caregiving in their life, 
every single person would have to be able to come up with a story because every single one of us has benefited from this fundamental human need to care for other people. Whether that was us as children, whether that's us now caring for children or for elderly parents, whether that's caring for someone with disabilities. So I think it's really time to think about how can we actually have the conversation and recognize that it's an issue that applies to every single person on the planet. Just give me one second. I just want to, is there any way that I could ask for a little bit more silence over here? Do you mind? Do you mind just a bit? Look, I mean, like, and the reason, and I invite you, actually, don't go, come. This is an important topic. <laughs> and the reason is an important topic. Look, we're all very busy. I was, like, in two lunches and having, you know, three different panels. But caregiving and caring is a word that will be increasingly important in the future. The reason why I chose to actually leave the lunch where I was and, like, meet everybody else and come to this one session that I wanted to moderate is because we're not seeing how powerful this word and that function will be in the future. Everybody and the, with the pandemic has re understood that machines are not caring and that care, like humans are going to be actually increasingly going to be remunerated because of that function. And in my community, which is the Latino community, and Patricia particularly represents Latinas uh, being caregivers in a world or automation, caregiving and caring will be an important function that we will have to capitalize on. And for companies that want to retain their staff, you have to procure for, for employees as caregivers and caregivers two ways, so upwards and downwards. So I think that be, me being the, you know, like the dog that smells the stone 20 years before like anyone starts, I think that caring is going to be an increasingly important topic. So I apologize. I just wanted to make sure, come join us here. There's a seat here. I just wanted to invite everybody to also quiet the conversation. Please go on. So I can, so um, I would like to start by zooming into, I think, where it all starts, you know, as parents at least, you know, becoming a mother or a father. And, and because I think that's where the, you know, we see a divide, right? So, you know, in many countries at least, you know, mo just as many women as, as men go into education, we have the same ambition. Um, we start you know, our career. Then we go, we, we become parents, and then you start, right? So then you go on your leave, and then many don't come back. Um, so I think that is one of the areas where we really need to zoom in and think about how can we, you know, have at least the flexibility, and as employees, as leaders, give equal opportunity for men and women to take care of our children and have that leave and come back. And I think this is not only maternal leave, it's also paternal leave, because I think, you know, this is where you know you're starting otherwise to divide and conquer uh, and which may be fine in some households but maybe not in others so i think this is one of the areas we need to start as employees at leaders to, to pave the way for women and men to to get right back and be caregivers but also to take the pursue the career that we would like to pursue and can i ask you i mean like some some of the biases that you either personally or you have seen in companies where how do how do they look like right like you said um uh, uh like something that you have uh, like seen personally childcare or other practices that have been biases that we particularly with technology could revolutionize and, uh, revolutionize and change well, that's something I think that is changing right now because people everywhere are questioning their relationship to work, their relationship to their employer, their place in informal and informal economy. So actually, I think the bias right now is shifting because also in the global north, we have a labor shortage. In the global south, we have an abundant talent and too few jobs. So I think those biases are going to start to change as some of those uh, trends bear out. And also, as you say, as the rising tide uh, for care uh, explodes because of our aging populations. But I think it would be, I think for this conversation, it's also important to think about the kind of broader global system that's broken. I think you mentioned the care structure and how it's a house of cards, and certainly COVID exposed what it already was. But I mean, let's bring into this conversation right now, women and girls all over the world offer 10 
trillion dollars in unpaid care work every year. It is 10% of the global GDP. It is a massive wealth transfer that uh, girls and women are forced to offer economies and employers every day and all over the world, and it's not getting better. Certainly the pandemic showed us what that looks like, but that is not a situation that's getting better. And so all over the world, I wasn't the one to say this first, but some countries have social and safety nets, the rest of the world has girls and women, and that is it. And those girls and women have been stretched to the limit right now during the pandemic. And I, getting back to your question about bias, what I worry about is that some employers, um, instead of recognizing that, you know, if we want capitalist economies, and that is something that we, that we can discuss the merits of that probably on another panel, but if you stipulate that that's what we want, capitalist economies require, they require children to be future consumers and workers. Women are providing those future workers and consumers and then doing all the care for them and then also doing all the work in companies. Because the face of poverty all over the world is a woman, especially if she's a black woman, especially if she's a single parent, especially if she's a disabled woman. It's not a question about whether she wants to work, it's where and how and what or to what ends. So this question of bias, which I think is shifting because of the labor squeeze, is a really important one. Uh, because women have to work and these economies have to work for women if we want economic growth. And I'm, I'm waiting. I am desperate. I'm waiting for companies to really figure that out. I think some of them are grappling with it. But I think by and large, this is just a nut that we haven't cracked. And to Michelle's further point, if the child care need was met around the world, it would add $3 trillion to the global economy. $3 trillion. Sure, that's still, there's still a gap that we would need to close with respect to women and girls offering that care work for free, but that's a huge opportunity just on child care alone. And I love what you said, Anna, too, about on-ramps back into the workforce for people who have taken time away from their jobs um, to care for a child that was just born. I mean, that's one of the places I'm sure we'll take the conversation next is what are the policies that companies can institute that really facilitate women's work working in an office, in a corporate setting? Is that what you wanted to comment on? Well, I was going to say one thing about the giving money back. It will also reduce the amount of you know, psychiatry appointments, blood pressure medicine, the, the stress behind who's got the kids today. I, I think it's unbelievable. And I think it is not the, the child care system is not set up to be able to support dual working parents at all. One of it, something has to give. You can't have everything. Um, and I think going back into the workplace, it's the workplace fostering that environment. First, it has to be an environment of caring, understanding. I think the, the really important thing about actually giving care is you start to think about your own teams and the way you act at work in a very different way. You, you move into flat organizational structures. You move into, hey, how are you? How's your day going? Rather than, have you got this done? What's next? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important. You know, as a company, we, I think COVID, for me, was liberating. You know, I took my kids to school every day. And it just re gave us a chance to reset and rethink. Uh, as a company, what we did, we gave people pandemic leave through that. 30 days, no questions asked. You, you're stressed, you need to care for someone, you need to look after your children, anything like that, go for it. You are the most important person at the organization, and not so the tech, that's not anything else. company policy. Company policy, absolutely globally, um, because we've realized we need people, we want the intellect we have in our, in our staff. We don't want them nine to five. We want them to be at their best self, and you do that by supporting people, having the right policies, fostering an environment to allow people to say, it's okay not to be there at this given moment, but I can do my job. Uh, and that has come from the top. Anyone else on policy, either governmental, corporate? Yes, please. I love the companies that are encouraging men to take parental leave. Yeah. It has been a tradition for a long time for men not to take their leave at all, um, for companies not to give um, uh, the, the non-birthing parent uh, the, a kind of leave that the birthing parent had. That is changing. But I love the bosses, especially men, who stand up and say, I won't promote you if you don't take that leave. You are telling me something about your life and your priorities and your judgment. I'm not going to promote you. So... You know, in the States, there's been some, you know, controversies about, um, you know, some kind of big mouths calling people, men who take parental leave, um, disparaging them for doing that. But I love the, the managers who stand up and say, take your leave. Take your leave, fathers. You got to do it. It's a great, it's a great for companies to do that. Just yeah. say really quickly, the, the one, I, I work with American companies. Uh, I am an American company. The thing that really annoys me, and I, I check every year around about in beginning Q4, I want to see all of my organization where are you with your leave? And I want to find out and say, hey, take your leave. We give it to you for a reason. Okay. I want you to take it. This is yours. This is not, you know, you're right, you know the company saying you, you, you shouldn't really use all of it. 
go and take it. And I think again, it go, comes back to culture. Absolutely, I think there's a difference between the policy and then the, the culture that either supports the policy or creates an environment where the unspoken rule is actually, well, you shouldn't really take all of your paternal leave, right? And that's, that's such an important thing. And, and also, I love what you said James, about pandemic leave, because it sort of encompasses the many ways that we can be caring for ourselves, for others. And I wouldn't want this conversation to get us into a place where we're pitting caregivers against those who don't have those responsibilities. Yet, I believe that a workplace that really supports policies for caregivers is a better workplace for everyone right, from a mental health perspective, from not necessarily making your life entirely about work, in so many other ways. This is not just about creating a carve out for those who happen to have to come go pick up a child from a soccer game or you know have to stay home in the morning with someone who has a sore throat. This is about everyone and creating a healthier environment and therefore a healthier and more productive company. You and wanted to mention something. Yeah. yeah, no, I would say just add to that. And I think you, as, a, you know, as an organization, that can be your competitive advantage, right? So, so for example, at Maternity Foundation, you know, I joined nine you have years to go ago. Yeah. 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 Um, coming from McKinsey, you know, having been a partner in KPMG, and, and you really have struggling, you know, at that point I had three small children, the youngest being five months, you know, so starting being self and what would work for me, you know, and then building the culture of maternity foundation both in, in India and in Ethiopia and in Copenhagen based on, you know, what works and how can we make this a competitive advantage and tap into the super talented parents who also would like to and we just, you know, to, to have that balance. And we did an assessment two years ago about our values. And the, you know, the main value that was mentioned was flexibility and trust, because it, it comes with trust, right? So, so I think so it's, 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 it's about attracting talent. Also. So let's be, let's be clear. What I hear is that if you're a company in the next five years and you don't have policies about caregiving that are going to give individuals the flexibility to be able to care for everyone in their environment, not only when you have a baby, but also when yes. you have a parent, when you have a sister or something like that, you're probably going to be out of business. I would like to just like, you're I gonna know you're going to lose. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. And I would love to ask Patricia Mota, who represents 85,000 Latinas that want to get into the workplace, what would your members say to a company to say, like, to make them more, uh, you know, like, attractive? Like, company, you want to win my heart as a Latina leader? Like, what, what, what are those policies? You know, jumping into them. <laughs> no, I, I think I mean obviously it's being able to have the flexibility in the workplace. A lot of the things that are that are being mentioned, um, Latinas being drivers of the 2.7 trillion GDP that the Lat U.S. Hispanic Latino community represents, which would be, um, if you compare it to a country, a GDP would be the eighth largest country. And so, I think you know some of the policies around flexibility, workplace, and being able to take care of aging parents and and children at home, right? So everything that I, I echo that's been mentioned, I would say. So flexibility as Absolutely. number one. So do we need, and, and I know, uh, like we're gonna move on from policies to more skill set, and what can we actually learn from here, and then any other topic that you think that we should cover mm. in a couple of minutes that can we I have. Can add like, one more yes, thing? Yeah, um, I think it's really important, like workplaces that work for women work for humans. Exactly. And workplaces that work for humans are workplaces, are companies that are gonna win. And like, and this is really, like companies where women are in leadership roles, companies that don't use diminishment in their advertising, companies that uh, have equal pay, companies that have lead, they have higher revenue. They have more innovation. They have stronger supply chains. They win the talent wars. Right. They win consumer loyalty. Those companies are gonna win. So I'm sure there are companies who are like, I can't afford a flexible workspace. I can't afford all these policies. You can't afford not to have those things. <laughs> But, uh, like there's even bias to hire people that might have children it, like they see you and they're like oh you might actually have like there's we're starting from <laughs> really way back right like so um do we need governmental policy to ensure you know like to support any of the corporate or is that like an we, impossible we, i mean i think we need government policies that work and that are enforced right in terms of actually trying to diminish the biases that inevitably creep in around hiring women or hiring caregivers and then we need more leadership within the private sector, which we're starting to see, I think, positively a lot more to say, oh, you're five months pregnant? I don't care. Yeah. I'm going to hire you anyway because you're going to be a great asset to my company. And you're going to come back, and I'm going to on-ramp you, and we're, that's going to engender employee, lawyer, employee loyalty from you to me and to this company for a long time to come. So if you believe in someone and you want them to trust you, that trust has to last. 
over the course of, yes, having a baby and staying home for a while to care for that baby or whatever it might be. Um, so you're saying that companies are already making that transition. I do think you, can they I are. Can I just like get a hand from the audience? Do you think that companies are already woke about like caregiving and flexibility to employees? Okay, there's one optimist here. There you go. So I think that we have no, work to do. But this is why this conversation is so critical. It's paid family leave and medical leave. It's sick leave. It's um, it's flexibility. It's pay equity. I mean, you know, Michelle, you mentioned that point, but that's a huge point in terms of making workplaces that work for women. They need pay equity. Okay. And those are the things that we're trying to work so on. I'm sure. Splunk I think is that you on. are like yes. keeping. Like, is there anything else that you want to say on this? Yeah. We employ people for the long term. You know, I want someone to be able to turn up to their best self, whether it's me, whether it's any of my team. That means I have to care for myself, care for others, feel flexible, feel supported in that. Because let's face it, no one really works nine to five Monday through Friday. I, mean, I, I certainly don't. You can still be incredibly productive when you're at your best self with the time that you have, if you feel supported with people around you. Um, it, it's basically about being good human beings and wanting to foster that environment. It doesn't always come from HR. It doesn't always come from the company because it's hard to codify that sometimes. Sometimes it's leadership saying, go away, go home, get it sorted, and, and starting to build that culture slowly. It's going to take time, but it has to be people leading from the front. So I heard a number of conversations throughout about like the need to create belonging and inclusive environments where people feel yeah. that they can be themselves. We've heard enough about like the flexibility. So it has to be results oriented as opposed to, you know, like uh, warming the seat oriented. Um, what else are we missing? So I would love to, to just like quickly switch at some point, you can go um, about the skill sets. So we're talking about companies, let's talk about the individuals that are caregivers and what can we learn about the caregivers and how can companies be wise and, you know, like an, and visionary to say those are the skill sets that I might need because that's actually, you know, like in the future how much, you know, like with automation, how much, you know, like more valuable those skill sets will be. So you wanted to say something else about that no, maybe before, just, about the future. Yeah, maybe I'll just briefly answer your question and I would say, you know, sometimes, I don't know if it's a skills, but, you know, having someone on your team that has to leave at two, three, or whatever it is, you know, y you know they get the job done. You know, so I think it makes, you know, it gives some productivity. You know, you know the job is done. So I think that is, you know, by having to, you know, get a lot of things done. So uh, you're saying that caring people are productive, uh, uh, not only caregivers but caring. Yeah, caring people and caring people have, you know, a broader set of. I wouldn't. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a skill, but it's an approach, right, to things and mindset. And I think that is a value all the way through. And that's why we need diversity, in you know, at all levels in our organisations. At the same time, we need role models. And I think there's been a lot, for example, back in McKinsey, you know, there was always this focus on female role models. You know, who can you mirror? I don't know. She made. She she got it. But I definitely think what we need to talk about now is the male role models, because this has to be definitely you know, something that has to be driven just as much from the men as from the women, as you were mentioning. So I think role models is another thing that we need to really invest in and celebrate. Anyone else? On, again, I'm not thinking only caregivers, because when you care, where you're a caregiver is because you care, and you're a caring, uh, you have a skill. Like anyone else on skill set that could be transferable or look, look like searchable? Anyone else on that? I have a complicated answer on that. Okay. Here's what I worry about. Number one, there are there are people in the workforce who are not caregivers right now. They might be one day. And I don't want to create two classes of like caregivers are extra special and extra productive and people who don't care are not. I think it definitely just, you have to keep put them on a level field. How do they perform? And do they both perform well? Because we've encountered uh, women um, in the workforce who were, because they're caregivers at home, they're given the work like, will you get the birthday cake? You know, will you bring the snacks? Will you comfort the person whose family member just died? And all they want to do is run the PL. And they'd be great at running the PL. And they don't want to do those things. So I think we have to be careful kind of about the kind of what the skills suggest. At the same time, there was a recent study, and oh, I remember I wish I remember her it came out of, but I think it was covered in Bloomberg, that young women who didn't uh, didn't have care working response care responsibilities were viewed just as negatively as women who did because they were seen as operating outside of the norm. They were working really hard. They were working long hours. They were at the top of their class. They were viewed by their peers in the same negative ways as the women who were leaving to go uh, pick up the kids from soccer. Mm -hmm. So I think some of that, you know, it, we got to get really clear and really honest about performance and not about kind of like what the characteristics are in your life that, that you bring to work every day. Which All is right. why it is important to, of course, acknowledge and really honor the fact that you 
it's not only women who are caregivers, yes. that's super important, but we also can't get, we have to do both and, yeah. right? It's always the complicated answer, it's always the nuance, which is to say women disproportionately uh, experience bias in the workplace around their caregiving responsibilities. And there was um, some research I heard about recently too that said that even when women out earn their male spouses, yes. they still do a disproportionate amount of care work at home. Right. And we could probably unpack that for a while as yeah. well in terms of why that's the case. Because if I'm out earning my spouse, whoever he or she may be, right. what does that mean in terms of the, the cognitive labor, the physical labor that I'm also doing at home with the children, with the house, with the gardener, whatever that might be? What is that that we're talking about? And we're right. going to wrap it up. I'm, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to give your final message, thinking that you're recorded, that there's cameras, and that you are going to be, like, we're going to be seeing this five years from now, thinking, yes, we started talking about the need of doing this. So what would be the message for Davos, the Davos leaders here, whether you're like an employer or an employee or representing so many other people about like, uh, how does the future look like? What are the things to act and what are the things to watch out? Do you want me to go first? Whoa. Mm -hmm. I'm furious about the unpaid care burden. I'm furious about that wealth transfer. I want policymakers all over the world to do something about it. I'm glad the United States government is interested in this, the government of Mexico, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and so many others. There is nothing in our biological sex or our gender identity that makes us better at vacuuming than anybody else in the house. <laughs> and we've got to stop acting like that's true. Taking care of each other, taking care of homes, that is the universal work of all of us. And we have to stop insisting on that unpaid wealth transfer uh, to societies all over the world. It is undermining everything we want. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say, um, you know, whether it's today or if it's five years from now, I think we have, you know, there's a way to go. But I think we need to start where, you know, where you are as a leader and with who you're working with and then make it work for each person, you know, whether that is a woman or a man or, or whatever it is. So it's, it's the taking care of the individual needs and using the flexibility around that. That will be the common denominator of today, tomorrow, and, you know, in five years. I think workplace leaders need to have the policies, the culture, and the courage to create an environment that works, yes, for all caregivers, but in particular for women. I'm going to make you on the, on the courage side, um, but also what's your plan to go and help you know, each other? Um, think about caring. Uh, to your point, um, I do a lot of that at home. The thing I'm really bad at is the cognitive load. Um, so it's something I'm having my personal kind of goals at the moment to try and share that more equitably. But it's, it's just about have a think about how to be a good human and how do you go and foster that culture in the workplace. Well, I want to thank every one of the panelists. Before you do that, before you do that, I just want to grab a seat oh, at the table here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hi, Rhonda. Thank you from the Female Coach. And this has been an amazing conversation. And uh, building a, a, a care ecosystem in the workplace is something that we have been thinking a lot about. And we just, uh, part of our Flipping Point videos, we created a video on it. So as we end this, if it's OK with you, Claudia, we'd love to share. Absolutely, because we do need a new narrative. A narrative that is visible, that we're elevated, that people understand, that there is like business. You know, we have to make the business case of this narrative. So a video is a great start. Great. Let's go ahead and play the video. I think the flipping point is recognizing the link between the culture of care and the productivity and other benefits that will come to your workplace. So much of what companies do are driven by the workers on the front lines. And those workers are going home to children who may be having educational problems. They're going home to older parents, parents with chronic health issues. And if CEOs were able to understand the fact that all of their workers have whole lives and were able to create policies and practices and norms that accommodate those whole lives, we would all be much better off. Undo the narrative that what's good for workers is bad for business and actually take a look at the evidence that shows implications for GDP, productivity, ROI. We've got data on all of this. Access to things like paid leave so that new moms don't have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. And so that dads have more than a couple of days to be there to support their new child. And things like fair scheduling. All of these things are proven to improve happiness, productivity, retention, loyalty, overall profitability for companies. These are win-wins and they've been disregarded as nice-to-haves rather than must-haves. We need to be clear about which workers we're talking about.
because the interventions that you need may be different depending on who you're talking about. You know, if you're a CEO and the worker that you're picturing that you're trying to help is a professional white woman, you are missing the boat with respect to women who are paid low wages, black, Latina, and immigrant women, workers who are caregivers who have left the workforce at disproportionately high rates. And this means that the economy is missing the value of this labor, which is estimated to be up to a trillion dollars. And it means that your company is likely suffering the effects of not having enough people, whether it's directly or whether it's indirectly. The CEOs that get it most right are the ones who recognize that their entire workforce needs access to policies that offer childcare or childcare stipends, that ensure workers have access to paid family and medical leave and to paid sick time, that aren't stigmatizing them for using it or putting hurdles up, and make sure that those policies apply to all workers, whether it's contractors, whether it's hourly workers, whether it's your admin staff or whether it's your professional workers. Everybody's got these needs and too often within workplaces. I would say we are at an inflection point. We will either go forward and create an inclusive workforce that creates a robust competitive economy or we will stagnate. And so I really encourage CEOs to embrace a culture of caregiving, to recognize what their own workforces need up and down the types of employees and be a leader in, in your industry and in the public sphere as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.